the, the beer going into the tanks, these are fermenter tanks, so the beer coming in here is about 64 degrees Fahrenheit. We pump uh, yeast out of that ale yeast brink there. That's pushed in. And uh, that's kind of the fourth ingredient, I guess, in beer is yeast, although it's not really an ingredient, but it does have flavor characteristics. And we push the ale yeast in. We set the uh, thermostats for 68 degrees. So um, as the yeast starts fermenting the beer and has this huge party in there where it's eating sugar and it's having a great time and it's fornicating and replicating and turning into all kinds of little other yeasts and, and everything's, everything's happy, it also generates a lot of heat and it generates CO2 gas. So um, we cool the heat down with recirculated cold glycol refrigerant in some uh, jackets in the tank just to try to keep a lid on things. Otherwise they would actually heat so high that they would kill themselves. And then the CO2 actually just all gets vented up um, out of the building through that uh, tank in the back. We keep, we're not quite big enough to be able to reclaim CO2. But if you look at a carbon footprint uh, definition, it takes um, to, to grow barley takes about um, six parts of CO2 out of the atmosphere to make the barley plant. And we're putting one part CO2 back into the atmosphere here. So we're actually um, reducing CO2 in the atmosphere by growing barley. And even though we're releasing it in the back, back end, we're still releasing a lot less than we actually use up. So in our carbon footprint, it's kind of a weird calculation, but you have to take into account what's actually going on with the plant and what we're doing in the end. So there's a, there's a good balance there. Um, each tank takes two brews, about 5,000 gallons. It's about 2,000 cases of beer. And it goes, these are ale fermentations. They're warm, they're fast. Uh, if we were making lager beer, it'd be a colder, slower fermentation. Um, but we could turn these tanks around in about seven days, about five days of fermentation, two days of cooling, and then they're ready to transfer. Started with, in the other tanks or the fermenters, it starts out at about 13.5% sugar, and in about three days, it drops to about 3.5% sugar. And then we give it two days to sort of finish off. Then we cool it down to 34 degrees. And then we drop it or pump it down to this cellar here through a heat exchanger to cool it down to 32 degrees. And then we hit it with some findings to try to precipitate out the, uh, the leftover yeast and stuff like that to kind of clarify it. So these tanks are in a kind of a, a nice, this is an old building and every room in this building, I had to kind of think about what is it that I want to have happen here and how's the geometry of the tank going to be affected. So having short ceiling space, I went for long horizontal tanks. The tanks are, uh, have got jackets on them and they're insulated. And so the beer inside of here is 32 degrees. But out here outside, in the, it's very quite comfortable working out here in the, uh, in the aisle way. In the large industrial breweries, they would actually have whole cellars that are kept at about 29 degrees. Very uncomfortable to work in, especially in the summertime. So uh, we're able to keep a nice temperature controlled climate for the beer and a temperature controlled climate for the people as well in this area here. And the beer will stay in here and just let, we're just let it settle out for about a week and then we tap it off of here into filtration, which is the next step. So anyway, we, we uh, filter out of those horizontal tanks through a uh, diatomaceous earth filter. Um, diatomaceous earth is a silica, it used to be a little animal, it used to be a little diatom. And it's a, it's a skeleton from the diatoms that we use. And it just, the beer goes through and it strains out the yeast and the cigarette butts and tires and cats and anything that's gotten into the beer. Kids, a lot of kids, lot of yeah. Kids. Um, strains all that out. And we end up with as, as tight or as loose a filtration as we want. With the IPA, we, we have a kind of a, a haze in the beer that we want to keep so it kind of glows in the glass. With uh, Blue Heron or Haymaker, we want to have it crystal clear so we, we uh, ferment it, we uh, filter it pretty, pretty tightly. The brew house is the slowest step. Everything else here is a lot easier to do. And we can filter two brews, basically one of these tanks, excuse me, in about two and, two and a half hours. Um, so usually the guys would do this on night shift to, uh, to supply the packaging home the next day. This is kind of the last stop for the beer prior to going to bottles. Coming out of the filter, it comes through these uh, pipes in the back and then we use a hose connector to get into the, the each, either tank that we want to use. Um, the tanks are, are called bright beer tanks, so the beer goes through one final, there's my head filter guy, Tom Slotman, 
and we fill the tanks up. We go through a carbonation procedure and or we add sugar and yeast. If we're making IPA, we'd add sugar and yeast so it can uh, naturally ferment in the bottle or the keg. Those tanks have got little mixers in them. Um, when we made Stumptown Tart, uh, we actually put uh, Belgian triple beer into the tank and since it's got the mixer in it, we put the cherries in there too so it would mix up and get this nice mix contact, fruit contact with the beer and that's why it tastes so yummy because it's got lots of, uh, lots of fruit contact. Um, but in any event, these tanks, the beer only stays here about 24 hours, goes through one last check and then it goes into packaging. Once again, this building, this particular room, tall ceilings. This is where the old steam engine used to be. And back when this was a rope factory, if you wanted to power a, a machine back in the 1880s, you had a boiler and you had a steam boiler and you had a steam engine that ran off the pressure from that boiler. And the steam engine would have a huge flywheel on it. And the flywheel would drive a, a belt to a smaller wheel. And that wheel would be linked by belts all around the, uh, the building. And you can see little places around the upper floors where there's still the old uh, shafts and, and pulleys. So when they wanted to energize a machine, they would take a stick or their finger, if they still had one, and they would uh, knock the belt onto the pulley, and that would energize the machine. You couldn't just plug something into a wall and turn it on. They didn't have, they didn't have electricity, so they all went off steam. So the steam engines were huge, huge uh, machines, big iron machines, and that's what was in this building, this room here. So when I designed these tanks, I knew I wanted tanks actually that had as least air contact as possible because air will make the beer taste stale. So a tall skinny tank has got this air contact like this as opposed to a big wide tank. So I wanted tall skinny tanks. This worked out really well and I guess it was destined to be. So uh, this is where we have our bright beer and the beer, like I say, just stays in here about 24 hours and away it goes. That's where the packaging. This is a packaging area here, probably the most expensive room in the house. Literally millions of dollars worth of equipment packed into as tight a space as you can imagine. And um, everything in here is built to mimic the human hand. So our glass comes in on pallets. It's uh, empty bottles that are already pre-packed into uh, six packs and, and case cartons. And they end up on this conveyor here. They're relayed to a, a guy over here that stands up. And he's got a little, uh, a little table. And the thing comes up. He slides them across and puts them onto a... Uh, a little conveyor that goes into the uncasing machine. And the uncasing machine, just like human hands, has got all these little fingers. It's got 48 fingers. It goes in and takes two cases worth of glass out at a time, lifts them up, puts them on the top conveyor, and then sort of separates it from the box, and the box goes underneath. So that's a $175,000 machine just to pick up glass and put them onto a table and drop them and come back again. It only takes us three people to operate this. There's one person that puts the boxes on on this end, there's one person at the labeler, and there's one person that drives a forklift. When we first started bottling in 1985, I had 12 people to do this. We did 40 bottles a minute with 12 people. Now we do 300 bottles a minute with three people. So it's very, uh, very streamlined, but very highly automated. 